Welcome to chapter 11.1. We are talking about how cells communicate. And uh, before we get started, I want to introduce a few concepts that are going to show up uh, throughout the chapter. And if we can just sort of talk about them now, then we'll have a good understanding of them so that when we're trying to wrap our head around bigger, more difficult concepts, we'll have already learned these. So first, uh, transmembrane proteins. These tend to be composed of alpha helices, as you can see. And they're called transmembrane proteins because they span the, the width of the, the membrane. And this is beneficial because it's going to be able to take messages external to the cell and bring them into the cell. So we can see here that there's a binding site or uh, where there's going to be some sort of communication factor is going to be able to bind here. And it's going to send the message down to the cytoplasm or into the cytoplasm. And so where the message is going to be received by potentially a G protein, which we will talk about later. Um, and so, like I said, these are generally composed of alpha helices because they have to span the, the whole length of the, uh, the membrane. The next concept I want to talk about is the difference between GTP and ATP, which is not very much. GTP and ATP are very similar. Just the difference is that GTP has a guanosine and ATP has uh, an adenosine. The difference comes uh, all from what they do in the in the cell. So ATP can be is tends to be used for energy, whereas GTP tends to be used for communication and signaling. And we don't necessarily understand why that is so because they are very similar. They have three phosphate groups, and GTP can be used for energy, but the cell tends to use it as a signaling protein, and it tends to use ATP as uh, energy. But it does make sense that the different metabolic pathways are going to be using different molecules. This is going to help to keep the metabolic pathways from sort of intertwining and getting uh, getting mixed up. And so um, this is why we suspect that GTP is used, while they're very similar and can do the same things, that GTP is used for communication and ATP is used for energy. Finally, uh, the third concept that I want to introduce is a kinase. Kinases are types of enzymes that simply uh, take a phosphate from an ATP and attach it to uh, a protein. And so um, we can see here's our reactants. Here's our enzyme, the kinase, that facilitates the chemical reaction. We can see that we now have one less phosphate group, and it is attached to our enzyme. And so know that phosphates can bind only to three amino acids on a protein, tyrosines, serines, and threonines. I bring this up because I want you to sort of trigger this, this notice, or I want you to remember tyrosine, because this is going to come up later. Um, and so let's move on now to, com uh, to communication. Whether you are a single-celled organism or you are a multicellular organism, cells need to communicate. So let's start at, uh, at the beginning, at the most basic single cell types of life. So here we have yeast cells, and there are two mating types. There's mating type A and mating type alpha. And we can see that mating type alpha produces a, a mating factor that's like a pink triangle. In real life, it is not actually a pink triangle, but we are using these pictures to show that how it is different. And so the mating type a is going to produce the little purple sphere. And the receptor on the alpha is going to receive the, the little sphere. And so this is going to, when, when one receives the mating factor of the other um, in their receptors, what's going to happen is that they're going to be able to combine and they're going to fuse their, they'll be able to fuse their genetic material. And we have a new cell with combined genetic material. And so why do we need to go through all of these steps in order to combine? Why can't two yeast cells just combine? Well, because you need to, they need to know that uh, they're the same species. Because if they were two different species, the genetic material wouldn't be able to combine uh, successfully. And so these receptors and mating factors allow one yeast cell to identify uh, another yeast cell. And so it's a, it's a form of communication way that cells communicate is through something called quorum sensing. And this is uh, how um, biofilms, or which is the, uh, the stuff that you find, the, the plaque that grows on your teeth, 
this is how that's produced. So it's just a form of uh, communication between bacteria. So when there are bacteria um, on uh, a material and it is a, a place that is going to be highly successful for the bacteria to, to proliferate on, uh, the bacteria will produce a film. Um, and this is called a biofilm. And this is going to communicate to all of the other bacteria. They're going to say, multiply, this is a good spot. Um, and secrete a specific enzyme or secrete a specific protein so that we can um, accomplish this task. So this biofilm actually, as we said, is the stuff that can grow in your teeth. But it's also um, a slimy film that uh, you find on decomposing leaves. And it's actually, they grow on or they form on um, a lot of medical uh, tools. And so that's why oftentimes um, doctors um, have to throw away their medical tools after they've been used because you can't, it's really hard to get rid of these biofilms. Um, and so these are, the. this is just a, a product of single-celled organisms uh, communicating with one another. In multicellular organisms, um, the cells do not act independently of one another. They need to communicate with one another as well. So there's a few different ways because sometimes cells in a multicellular organism are going to be placed very closely to one another. Sometimes cells are going to be slightly distant and sometimes they're going to be very far. So uh, the cells that are in your toes need to uh, communicate with the cells that are in your nose. And so um, let's first talk about how cells that are very close uh, communicate. If it is an animal cell, um, we, we have talked about gap junctions before. Um, and so messages, factors can be uh, passed through gap junctions. If it's a plant cell, uh, plasmodesmata are how the, uh, the plant cells are going to uh, transfer a message. And so this is very important in, uh, it's very important for all cells, but sometimes more specifically um, for, um, let's say, embryonic development, because there's a lot, because all of the cells have, are communicating often. Um, and so you're going to have lots of gap junctions in um, embryonic development. If cells are nearby and not in direct contact, you're going to have something called paracrine signaling. And if we look at this uh, picture here, what's going to happen is that there's a secretory uh, vesicle, and it's just going to release factor, uh, some sort of signaling factor. And it's going to, it's going to travel a short distance um, to the target cell where there's going to be receptors and that's going to trigger some sort of change or some sort of communication into the target cell. So that's paracrine signaling. Um, an example of that is going to be growth factor. This is used to stimulate growth and division in nearby cells. We're going to talk more about that um, when we are talking about cell division. We're going to be talking a lot about growth factor. Um, another um, form of communication over a short distance, which we've already talked about, is synaptic signaling. So um, we have the presynaptic cell um, releasing neurotransmitter to the postsynaptic cell right here. And so that is going to be a short distance that, um, that the, the factor is going to be uh, traveling from one to the next, from one cell to the next. So let's talk a little bit more about um, cells that are um, communicating and that are not close by, that are not, uh, that are not connected to one another. So if they're not uh, connected to one another, if they're not close by, then we're going to be starting to use things like hormones. Hormones are uh, molecules that are used for communication um, or ligands. Remember that ligands are molecules that um, have like a, a it's an ion or a molecule that incorporates like a metal ion, um, atom in it. So if we remember like, um, uh, your heme group in hemoglobin that is a, a metal or an iron um, atom that is going to allow for the affinity of oxygen in your in your blood cells. Um, and so an example of a hormone response um, is let's think about epinephrine. Epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, um, triggers the flight the fight or flight response in animals. Um, and the, what happens is that when your adrenal glands release um, adrenaline into your body, um, your cells are then going to, the receptors on your cells are going to um, grab onto or attach to 
the epinephrine, and it's going to allow that cell to start breaking down the glycogen reserves. And so that, that glycogen is going to break down into glucose or into intermediates of glucose um, and, or intermediates of um, molecules that can enter into glycolysis. And so that's going to allow the organism to go through cell respiration and it's going to allow them to produce more ATP so that that organism can uh, respond. It can react very quickly. So think getting away from a predator, uh, moving really quick. And so that is um, one example of how uh, your cells are going to be communicating from, uh, from long distances. It's going to use a hormone or it's going to use a ligand. So there are three stages of cell signaling. Um, and the research, or the father of the cell signaling, um, started with the, the uh, scientist Sutherland in 1971. He was studying epinephrine. And what he did is he had two test tubes. And in one test tube, he put uh, glycogen. Um, so remember that that is a polysaccharide with many glucose molecules. Um, and our cells uh, have glycogen as reserves. Um, and then we, so he put the glycogen into a test tube with an enzyme that, that hydrolyzes it, breaks it down. Um, and in the other test tube, he put glycogen and the enzyme, but he also put intact living cells. So he put um, just cells, um, which he didn't do in the first one. And so the outcome was that the enzyme was only able to hydrolyze the glycogen when the intact cells or the living cells were present. And so what does this mean? This means that the enzyme is not interacting with the glycogen um, directly. It is interacting with the, uh, with the cell that is allowing the reaction to occur. Um, and so what is happening? This is called a signal transduction pathway. Or Sutherland's work suggested that communication happens in a, in a few steps. Uh, reception, transduction, and the response. So reception is, um, is right here. If we look in this picture, this is reception. So here's our transmembrane protein. Um, and here's our signaling molecule. And so it is going to attach to the receptor. And that is going to create a change in conformation. The protein is going to change shape, which is going to send a message to the inside of the cell. And so here we are uh, going to start our second part of the three-step process, which is transduction. Transduction is simply that the message is passed from one protein to another protein to another protein. Um, so these right here, and it's not necessarily proteins, let's call them molecules, that the message is sent from uh, relay molecules uh, down a pathway. So the message is sent from one to two to three um, and so this can be done in one step, but oftentimes it's many steps. Um, and they are, like I said, these are referred to as relay molecules. And so at the end of this transduction pathway, we're going to have, this makes a lot of sense, a response. Um, at the end of the pathway, a final response is triggered. So for example, the glycogen is hydrolyzed. Um, so the enzyme can then break down the, the glycogen. Um, and so the final response, this third thing, can be one of millions of any imaginable process in the cell. So is it the rearrangement of um, cytoskeleton? Is it turning genes on, off? It can be anything. Um, so, so here, Sutherland's work showed that the enzyme uh, to break down the glycogen isn't the only step uh, required to break down glycogen, that we, it had to go, we needed full intact cells with all of these relay proteins and the transmembrane proteins um, in order to break down the glycogen. And so that there's just more than, than one step. And that's what Sutherland's work told us. So I believe that's it for 11.1 .1, and the next video will be 11.2 where we continue to talk about um, communication within cells. Have a great day.